Welcome to another episode of the History Shorts Conversation Series. The purpose of these short conversations is to inspire thought and reflection, as well as provide our listeners with a quick opportunity of getting to know the people behind the research, the books, and the events that we call history. Our guest today is Mr. Roger Morehouse, known for, among others, for the forgers, the forgotten story of the Holocaust's most audacious rescue operation, first to fight the Polish War of 1939, and the Devil's Alliance, Hitler's Pact with Stalin. Our guest today is a famed British historian, author, and professor whose extensive research and books on Eastern European and World War II history have been translated into multiple languages. Mr. Roger Morehouse, welcome to the show. Hello, Peter. Thanks for having me. You have a specific concentration, right? That undoubtedly stems from your Eastern European studies at Mm -hmm. the University of London. Mm -hmm. But I assume your passion for history began much earlier. Can you walk us through your career as a historian and like what initially sparked your interest in history? I'm sure a lot of people in this position probably, uh, you know, have behind them a sort of, uh, you know, a childhood desire and, uh, you know, everything looks very linear in, in, in their careers. I'm sure there are examples of that. Mine isn't one of those, unfortunately. Um, so I didn't really do much at all at school apart from play sport and, you know, generally annoy my teachers. Um, usually I think, for, I think I might be gilding the lily a bit, but I think generally it was because I think I was seen as sort of wasting my potential to, in some way. Um, but it was, a, it, it was generally a sort of a, a, a rather sort of a friction laden relationship at school. I left school early. I left school at 16 and went off and did various things. And I sort of came back to education. I suppose when I was ready, when I was ready, when I was interested in the world, um, and that was after 1989, and, and uh, the, the revolutions of 1989 were were my sort of turning point, were my sort of Damascene conversion, as it were, um, because I was, you know, working, doing sort of menial stuff at the time, and um, I, I remember sort of rushing home from work to turn on the news to sort of see what had happened that day, you know, um, the, all through 1989. I mean, we, we sort of remember it, I suppose, in, particularly in the Western narrative, we remember it particularly for the fall of the Berlin Wall. But of course, as you will know, you know, the, 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 there's a long tail behind that, uh, particularly with the Polish mm-hmm. story, with solidarity, you know, going back into the 80s and beyond. Um, so I was quite aware of all of that. And, and actually through 89, you had the Polish elections in June, you had the, you know, the uh, Hungarians had already opened their frontier, for example, in the summer. So, you know, there was, it was bubbling under the whole, the whole sort of story of Central Europe was coming to the fore. And I found that absolutely fascinating, just watching completely from the sidelines, just watching it um, and thought, this is fascinating stuff and wondering what was going to happen. And then suddenly within, you know, a season almost, you know, from you take the, the, the moment that everyone sort of woke up to what was going on, which is the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then to the end of the year, the fall of the Ceausescu government with that, you know, that brutal execution of the Ceausescu's. Um, I just thought, wow, like the world literally had changed. Uh, it within months and I just thought how the hell did that happen Uh, and Mm. I was fascinated I was absolutely fascinated and I thought um, I really wanted to sort of study this and I wanted to know more about it and I sort of started reading popular history around it you know some of the stuff that came out at the time Um, and I really just wanted to know more and then and it, it sort of inspired me and I was I actually then with my work, I was, I'd already done a sort of a, an evening classes course. And I just thought, I quite enjoyed that. I quite enjoyed the experience of learning. So I thought, oh, I'll do it. I'll do history. I'll do a history A level, which is the, 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 the uh, exam I should have done at the end of school, but I left school early. So I went and did that and I had a, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I had a really good teacher and the teacher sort of pulled me aside one time and he said, are you planning to go to university? And I said, no, I, you know, I, I honestly wasn't. And he said, oh, OK, um, well, I think you really should. <laughs> so I just I started thinking about it and I, and I then applied and I thought, where would I go? What do I want to do? And I thought, that's what I want to do. Central Europe, Central European history. Um, and it kind of went from there. So I went to the School of Slavonic Studies in London, London University, which specializes in the history and language and politics and uh, all of that of culture of that region. Um, and I just loved it. I, I pitched up there when I was about 21 um, with a, 
you know, a modicum of maturity over the <laughs> 18 year olds out straight out of school, you know? Um, so I just absolutely grasped it with both hands. I loved it. Um, and, and thrived really. I kind of, you know, did very well, enjoyed it. Um, which is half the battle. If you feel, if you feel sort of, you know, excited by the, by what you're doing, it's half the battle. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I ended up in my third year studying under Norman Davies, doing Norman's um, modern Poland course. Um, and I sort of fell into that. So that I found fascinating. He was brilliant, uh, of course. And, um, and I ended up then, um, he asked me to do some work for him um, on the, he had a, one of his books was you know due to come out. That was Europe, a history, I remember. Um, and I did some of the, I did the index and the appendices and things like that on that. Um, and that sort of, that started a professional relationship, which has, which, you know, has lasted in, you know, pretty much until the present day. I, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that sort of focused my general Central European fa sort of fascination much more closely into Poland. So, um, it, you know, when you look back, it looks quite linear when I describe it like that. It looks like, it, it sounds like it's quite a straight line. Um, but it, it really wasn't, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, um, happenstance and it's very organic the way, the way life develops, you know, life isn't always as neat as we like to think it is in retrospect. When did you know that this was a career? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not even sure it is. <laughs> um, well, I'm still, you know, I still follow my nose it's, and it's a, it's a luxury to be able to do so because I'm not an academic. I mean, I, I, I'd have this, um, I have a visiting professorship in, in Warsaw at the College of Europe, which means really I go and I teach 20 hours a, a year. So I teach a course there, um, which is, you know, that's not me being an academic. So I, I always say that I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm a freelance historian, um, which gives you tremendous kind of um, professional and intellectual freedom. Uh, it's also, as they used to say of the serfs when they were liberated in Russia, freedom to starve. Um, <laughs> yes. But uh, um, no, so, you know, I, I, I'm still kind of, I have that luxury of kind of going from project to project, thinking, you know, what do I want to do now? What's interesting to me? Um, where are the gaps in the sort of, you know, the, the narratives that I want to try and fill and address? Um, and I can just kind of, you know, it's very self-indulgent. I can just sort of, you know, uh, indulge my um, my intellectual curiosity in that way. But in terms of, you use the word career. Um, it's a sort of, I mean, it's to, in a, to a to a large extent, honestly, it's a sort of an alien concept um, to me. I'm sort of, I, I sort of see myself more um, stumbling happily from project to project, <laughs> uh, and it, and if they do well, they do well. Um, you know, and 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 you get on with the next one. It's uh, I would I certainly wouldn't call that a career. So, considering all the research and all the years of research you've done, can you share one favorite story or anecdote or event from history that you find particularly intriguing or that you think deserves more attention? There are so many. I mean, what one thing that I like to try and do with all of my books, and this is where I suppose it's sort of um, where popular history sets itself apart to a large extent from academic history. Um, is is to sort of concentrate on the on the human angle, you know, and to have have strong characters as far as is possible. Um, and I always think of uh, the the outbreak of war in Second World War uh, in Poland. The po the the British um, military attaché to Poland was, um, as you may know, was Adrian Carton de Wiert, mm -hmm. who was um, the most incredible man. I mean, he'd, he'd served in the Boer War, he'd served in Somaliland, he served in the First World War. He had one eye, one hand, you know, he'd been wounded 16 times in his military career. He'd been shot in the head, shot in the foot, shot in the thigh, you know, through the stomach, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, it's just an astonishing. Yeah. Uh, and 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 when he was asked about, you know, he, he was he was, I think, wounded six times on the Somme alone. You know, I mean, it's 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 incredible this chap survived. And anyway, when they asked him post after the First World War about his experience of the war, well, he said, "Well, frankly, I rather enjoyed it." You know, I mean, it, so he's this sort of bluff. He was actually Belgian by by heritage, but raised in, raised in Britain. Um, and you know, someone like that, you know, he's absolutely larger than life. But you can see that, you know, without without the the wars that were going on at the time what would have become of him he just would have become this sort of 
you know, a bluff kind of storyteller in the pub or a businessman or whatever. So in a sense, you know, it's that happenstance that puts remarkable individuals in extraordinary circumstances. And you want to almost try and find those, uh, both the individuals and the circumstances to sort of bring them alive. Um, and then once you've found that stuff, I mean, I, you know, and as, as you well know, I mean, I find, I find Polish history actually sort of endlessly fascinating. Um, and part of that is to try and communicate a, a complex history and a multi-layered history to an outside world, which is largely, you know, the English-speaking world, which really doesn't understand it and doesn't know anything about it or understands it only on the most superficial level. Um, so you're, you're trying to sort of convey the complexity, you're trying to convey all those characters that I'm talking about, but you're trying to do so also within the sort of the within the confines, if you like, the, the, within the boundaries of the acceptable history, which is that, you know, you don't make stuff up, as you know, you don't yeah. if, you, if you say it was a sunny day, you have to you have to have researched the fact that it was a sunny day. Right. So that working, it's almost like it's like trying to do something in a straitjacket in a way. And that 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 is quite a kind of peculiar tension between wanting to make a. Uh, what you're writing as dramatic and as engaging as possible and yet doing so with often limited limited uh, material and limited resources but also with that caveat that you know if you if it, if you're going to say it was it was raining it has to have been raining right um so that working in that sort of straitjacket i f i actually find really really quite strangely exciting um <laughs> i quite enjoy that you know um because I've, you know, it's been said. A few people have said to me, "Why don't you write novels?" I don't know if that's because that's a negative commentary on my history. I'm not sure. But um, and I, I don't know. I, I feel like you know, having that free reign to just make everything up, to me is is too liberating. I I quite enjoy that sort of that that straitjacket thing. So um, that's one aspect that I. So you know, strong characters being able to sort of. Essentially, you know, historians are are you know fact wranglers. They they're sort of wrangling you know the material to put it into a, a form that is digestible for an outside audience. Yeah. Um, so you know, in a sense, you know, doing that with particularly with Polish history or anything else in you know, any subject that I've taken on that's that sort of I think has been underdone or has been um, perhaps looked at I would consider in a slightly skewed way and needs to be corrected. Um, so that's what that's what I sort of enjoy doing most. So there's so many, and at, at the same time, I'm not one of those. I suppose sometimes you imagine historians are interested in everything, uh, you know, all human history across the globe, and you know, since the year dot. I'd be very honest and say I'm not. You know, I'm really not. Um, I'm interested in what I'm interested in, and and I and because because I'm freelance and I can do these things, I can do what I want to do. Um, I'm allowed to indulge that, and I don't have to, <laughs> um, uh, you know, engage with histories that that uh, that don't uh, get me up in the morning. So, right, it's very self-indulgent. So your World War II research is all-encompassing, um, and like you said, it's it's very narrative. Your books read like I, I feel like I'm reading a thriller, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Good, thank you. Um, so you come across many different events, I assume, and people that you that you kind of are mentioned through your research that you mm. might put aside. If you had all the time in the world, do you think or do you have a topic that you're like, man, I really want to tackle this topic, but I just it's not the right time yet? I think that sort of relates. That kind of ties in a bit with my my previous answer that I, yeah. in a sense, you know, I'm very, I'm allowed, I'm allowed the space to to go and do whatever I whatever I like, and I think. You know, this to me is one of the one of the sort of key guiding principles. And it sounds I've come back to that word self-indulgent. It sounds dreadfully self-indulgent. <laughs> but the first thing you have to do when you're not an academic, so you haven't got, you know, a, a sort of a head of department saying you must do this and you must do that. When you have to motivate yourself and you're the one that has to get up in the morning and you're the one that has to sit in front of the computer and start with that blank page. And you have to do this for, you know, two or three years on a project. Um the first criterion that you have to apply is that it does this get me up in the morning, right? Is yeah. this interesting enough that it's going to sustain me? And if the answer is no, forget it. So consequently, you know, you're kind of duty bound to find the things that, you know, just be, be self-indulgent and find those things that interest you. Um, and there's, you know, there's enough of that. We all have our little, you know, our hobby horses and they, we find a niche. I've sort of found mine with between a little bit between German and Polish history in World War II. Um, which is quite a sort of a rich um, 
sort playground of, almost playground arena. exactly yeah. a playground for me to to play in well, I, either in sort of finding obscure bits of german history or retelling elements that have been sort of forgotten or trying to communicate the, the complexities of polish history and the fascination of polish history to an outside world um, so I've got no ambition to sort of talk about even World War II in the Pacific, you know, fascinating though it is, and I know people do great work on it, but I have no ambitions to go over there. I'm I'm quite happy, uh, you know, plowing my lonely little furrow. <laughs> do you uh, find yourself like picking and choosing like, oh, which project is going to become an article that maybe I could turn into an article of something that's smaller uh, in length and versus this is the one, like you said, I'm going to concentrate um, my time on. So I guess kind of the question would be like how do you decide which articles you want to work on as opposed to books uh it's kind of the other way around i think i think the articles tend to come out of the books to be honest because the primary activity i mean the one that you get sort of paid for as it were because you know you, i said before you know don't really see it see it as a career yeah. nobody does this for the money let's be honest yes um so uh the the, the primary engagement financially is to write the book so that has to be your your focus primarily. And then if anything comes of that, if there's a sort of juicy little nugget that can be pulled out and turned into an article, um, which can genuate, generate an, you know, another uh, another sort of small payment or whatever, or serve as a, as a foretaste of the book to come, then that then that that then so be it. You can sort of cull that out of your text. But it, it's the book first, and the articles are, come out of it. So your latest released, uh, The Forgers. Can you tell us a little bit about it, um, so our listeners could maybe go check it yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, a completely remarkable story, really. I was it came to me in 2018, um, and it, the story had only really sort of been discovered, I think, in 2016, and about two years before, and it had generated a couple of articles in the press and so on, and, and sort of limited interest. And it and it arrived on my desk from a a friend of mine in Poland who sent sent a couple of you know um, newspaper articles and said, "What do you think of this?" And I said, "This is fantastic." And it's basically the story of um, a group of diplomats and Polish and Polish diplomats and Jewish activists working out of wartime Switzerland, working out of the Polish embassy in war, wartime Switzerland, um, and uh, essentially illegally producing Latin American passports, which were then shipped into occupied Poland to assist primarily Polish Jews, uh, to escape the Holocaust. Um, and they produced um, docu identity documents for about 10,000 people. So it's a really large-scale thing, even though it, really it was sort of a cottage industry. It was quite sort of um, uh, quite primitive in, in, its, um, in its nature. And it's about that um, forgery operation. It's about how the their forgery kind of meshed with... Um, the German bureaucratic response to it because the Germans end up becoming, you know, kind of complicit in it because they're willing to recognize those passports. They know that they're fake, but they're willing to recognize them because it means that they can create a category of Jew, which they called exchange Jews, which they can then, they think, exchange for Germans held abroad. So to their mind, you know, this is win-win. They get rid of the Jews, they get, they get German blood back. Um, so the German response is really interesting. And then there's the sort of wider diplomatic response as well, because this becomes something of a political football. Most of the paperwork that they produced was Paraguayan. Um, and the Paraguayans got wind of this in 1942 and were not very pleased uh, and basically protested and said, well, we're not going to recognize those passports, which then, of course, became uh, a, a an issue for the Germans because if those people weren't Paraguayan Jews then they were just Jews and we know what happens to Jews in occupied Poland in 1943 um, so that becomes a sort of a uh, a diplomatic uh, wrestle between you know the Americans on one hand the Polish government in exile and its representatives and people like the Paraguayans so there's there's sort of multi layers to it and all the time you've got the holders of those documents who've been you know pulled out of the mechanism of the holocaust by the fact that they're now supposedly paraguayan jews and they've been sent to the concentration camp system instead so they're, they're pulled essentially if you can imagine it vastly simplified they're pulled out of auschwitz and sent to belsen concentration camp um, which is only marginally less horrible it's less immediately deadly but it's you know it's still full of disease overwork maltreatment all of that um, so the, the prisoners themselves, or these exchange Jews, as they're categorized by the Germans, um, then have to, you know, in some cases, survive two years in Belsen. 
So it's a, it's a sort of very multi-layered thing. It's, I think it's a fascinating story. And it's one, it's one that, as I said, wasn't known about, you know, even a decade ago, it had been forgotten. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm really pleased. I'm honoured really to, to have been able to contribute something genuinely new. Um, because this is one of the things that sort of frustrates me a little bit with a lot of popular history is that, you know, it tends to be quite kind of regurgitative, right? Um, mm -hmm. In that you'll have, certainly in, in British history writing, you'll get um, every year there'll be another book about the Dam Busters, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the Dam Busters is a great story, but, you know, it's done. It's done. Leave it alone. Um, we don't need another book about the Dam Busters. Uh, so this is th that that element of kind of just r sort of retreading an established story and you know saying it's new when it really isn't um, really frustrates me. And then to actually, you know, this is an example of something which is genuinely new. You know, the sort of it's not just publishing hyperbole; that is genuinely genuinely a new story. So uh, it's gr it's a great honour to sort of be able to contribute something new to the narrative. And at the same time, I'm really hopeful that you know given that this story will percolate um that you'll get people coming forward saying you know we had a paraguayan passport in our family history and we never knew where it came from uh, and this will and this is giving those people an answer to to how their ancestors survived the holocaust so you know i'm really i've already had examples of people coming forward like that um so i'm i'm really hopeful that others will will do the same that's amazing because of the fact like you mentioned this being so recent um did you have any Anything specific that you found really difficult as part of the research process to get this book together? Um, I had well, this was this was essentially my sort of COVID project, um, purely mm -hmm. by chance because it, it, you know I'd, I'd sort of agreed to do it, and sign contracts and so on at the end of 2019, um, and beginning of 2020, I basically had a sort of a, I suppose we'd now call it a data dump. Um, mm -hmm. I had a couple of. Um, 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 you know, data drives that were given to me um, with loads of uh, archival documents on them and various languages from various archives, which is various bits that have been done by other people. So my greatest task to well, sitting here in my office was to pull all of that together to make sense of that, which was quite a mammoth task, to be honest. And then to sort of try and, um, once you've made sense of what someone else had done, to then sort of do your own research as to fill in the gaps, and particularly that, that America, that um the German response was crucial because that hadn't been addressed at all. Um, and then that sort of wider context. So the, the job of, you know, with this book, it was to slot a, a comparatively, I wouldn't say small because it's not small, but it's a, con it's a comparatively niche story in itself, but to, to slot it into a much wider narrative, which is of, of Poland, occupied Poland, the government in exile during World War II, um, how the Holocaust develops, how knowledge of the Holocaust got out, how it's how it then um, influences Polish policy and allied policy. So there's so many threads to this that I had to sort of slot that narrative of the of the actual forgery operation, you know, into that wider um, uh, context. So that was the that was the great challenge, and to make that sort of then readable as well, if you like, you know, actually that someone would would want to turn the page. Um, but that you know, all of that is that's the historian's job uh, is to is as I said is to uh, is to fact wrangle and to turn it into something that's digestible to a, to the reading public. So there's nothing there was nothing out of the ordinary, but I think just the challenge of, um, in a sense, going going where literally nobody had gone before with that with that narrow narrative and try and slot it into the wider story. You know, that was occasionally quite challenging. Uh, before I let you go, like, what's your new research that you're kind of leaning towards and where can listeners go to stay up to date on your next releases? The current book I'm working on is on, uh, I've switched back actually, as I said, I sort of uh, oscillate a bit between Germany and Poland. Um, I've done now uh, two and a half books, I'll say, on Polish history. So there was The Forgers and before that was first to fight about the September campaign in 1939, which was in the um, US was called Poland 1939. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the half was the Devil's Alliance, which was about the Nazi Soviet pact. A lot of that, of course, being being uh, you know related to Poland. So I would say two and a half, the last two and a half books have been mm -hmm. um, very consciously uh, 
um, uh, concentrated on Poland. Um, so with this one, I, I sort of hit upon the idea of doing something on the on the U-boat war, on the Atlant- Battle at the Atlantic, which is something that I've always had a sort of boyhood fascination with going right back to, uh, you probably don't remember, Peter, you're too young, but Das Boot, um, the, <laughs> the German, German series, and then it was a movie yes. uh, in the early 80s. I mean, absolutely fantastic. And I kind of wanted to look at the Battle at the Atlantic and to look at it from or through the lens of the German accounts, which uh, hasn't really been done before. So most of the material on the Battle, battle at the, of the Atlantic, and there is quite a lot in English, tends to concentrate on, you know, the perspective is very resolutely from the destroyers and from the convoys themselves. And very often the U-boat itself is, is literally and metaphorically unseen, right? Uh, mm. So I wanted to sort of turn that perspective on its head and to tell the story from the perspective of the crews and using their own material, using ship's logs and all of that sort of thing uh, to tell it from their perspective. Um, So that's what I'm working on at the moment, which has got to be finished uh, end of this year and should come out next year. Um, It's it's very interesting stuff. Um, There's a, there's a lot of what I, what I do like doing is kind of taking um, a popular misconception and, uh, and, you know, trying I wouldn't say gently, not not always gently, but trying to correct it and say, well, actually, you thought this this was how it was. Well, it really isn't, and here's the proof. Um, and there's a bit of that in this as well. I think I think you know this would be uh, hopefully revelatory, and it and it's just really good. As I said at the beginning, this is really good. Um, you know, uh, human stories, human stories. Very odd, very often ordinary people plunged into extraordinary circumstances. Um, and there's a there's a lot of uh, you know their reactions and and how they respond to that is is often makes for very good copy. Well, Mr. Morehouse, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. My great pleasure. Thank you. You can find all of Mr. Morehouse books at your local bookstore, Amazon, or wherever you get your books. You can also follow him on X at Roger underscore Morehouse. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. You can also check out HistoryShortsPodcast.com for new announcements and original feature articles written specifically for the History Shorts website and not seen anywhere else. Thanks for listening.